Praise the Lord, everybody. Did anybody come to praise the Lord tonight? Why don't you stand to your feet and let's give God a praise in this place. God, we come to bless your name tonight. We come to give you our best praise. We come to give you glory. We come to give you honor. For you alone are worthy of our best praise, God. We give it to you today. We give you all. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. We come to worship you tonight. Hallelujah.
Somebody ought to tell God, open up the windows and pour out your spirit, God. Pour out your fire, God. Let it fall in this place. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. It feels good in the house of the Lord on a Tuesday night. Amen. If you're by somebody, why don't you turn to him and say, it's good to see you in church on a Tuesday night. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. And I'm thankful for the presence of the Lord that's in this place. I'm excited even on a midweek service to see what God's doing. Yes. Amen. He's just, it seems like he's just moving all the time. Amen. And uh, it's just fun to be a part of it and see what he's doing. I'm excited about what God's doing. How many other people are excited about what God's doing? I was talking to a man today. We were talking about the things of God, the Bible. Brother Joe, uh, I think he was on and off all day. And uh, there was points all day where we were fired up talking about the things of God. And uh, I said, I just, there's, there's nothing more exciting than living this life. I said, there's just no other life I'd rather live than just living for God. There's just, you know, it's an adventure every day. And sometimes it's stressful. And sometimes you're on the mountaintop. And sometimes you're down in the valley asking God, where are you at? But I wouldn't trade it for the world. I'm thankful for the goodness of God. Amen. We do have some prayer requests this evening. Brother Kurt, he's been fighting some sickness, but we know a God that can heal him. Amen. And lift him up. We love Brother Kurt. Faithful man of God. Amen. If he's watching tonight, we love you, Brother Kurt. We miss you. And uh, also the people that are traveling overseas, that God's hand would be upon them. Uh, his favor, the doors would be open. I believe in God's going to do a great things overseas this time around. He's done it every time since I've been here, but I believe in this time God's going to open doors that we couldn't even imagine. Amen. I believe there's going to be a revival over there. And if you have a need in your body tonight, maybe it's sickness, financial, maybe it's something you've been praying about, we encourage you to step out by faith again. We know a God that's a healer. He's a way maker. Whatever your need is, if the elders of the church would get ready, amen, we serve a God that's able. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to say this. I was standing over here, and I wasn't going to say it, but I it just crossed my mind, and I began to think about it, and I've talked about it before, but the woman with the issue of blood, for 12 long years, she dealt with this. She fought this, and the doctors, she went to every physician, the Bible says. She went to the doctors. She exhausted her resources, and by all accounts, the physical accounts, there was no hope for her, she, but then she heard about Jesus, and when Jesus came through, she began to press. There was still an element of belief and faith in this lady. Maybe she heard the stories that I've tried everything else. It's fell, and the enemy's lying in my mind right now saying, you've already tried this. You've been praying about this a long time. You've been going to the doctors. It's failed you. Nothing's going to work. It's hopeless. Your situation's never going to work. But I'm here to tell you that when Jesus steps in the room, the things that are impossible, the impossibilities of what the doctor can do, where their limitations stop, amen, God's abilities just begin, amen. So if you have a need in your body, I encourage you to step out by faith tonight and say, Jesus, I've tried everything on my own and it's failed, but God, tonight, you see the need. Why don't we pray this evening? Jesus, we love you. God, we feel your presence in this place. We feel your goodness. Thank you for being here, God. Oh, we love you, Jesus. God, everything you've done. God, we praise you. See every need, God. Everyone that stepped out by faith. Every situation. God, there's nothing hid from you. Do a work, God, in every life. Brother Kurt tonight. God, as he lays there in the sickness. God, I pray that you would raise him up. That you would heal him. That your peace would fill that room. God, that your presence, your anointing would fill that room right now. In the name of Jesus. God, our brothers and sisters that are overseas, those that are traveling, that your hand of protection would be upon them, God. But God, that you would go before them, that you would open doors, that you would do a work, God, as only you can. We give you praise, God, for what you're doing with our voices lifted all across this place. Why don't we begin to thank Jesus for hearing our prayers this evening? Thank you, Jesus. God, we love you. God, we love you. Hallelujah. You're worthy, God. You're worthy. Against the Lord, no. 
share you a little bit of a story. So last year, it started last year, we had to go, I, I don't even know what to call it, but we had to take someone to court. <laughs> and it, it, we weren't talking about a little bit, we're having to talk about something really big that we had to fight for. And every morning we'd pray at work and God, you know, you, you know, you know the job we did. You know everything. A lot of lawyers involved, all this stuff. And, and it, it was a struggle because I just kept seeing my bank account go like that, like that, like that. Because <laughs> lawyers are not cheap. <laughs> and Brother James says, when we win, he says, half that money's going to go to God. Sister Tina had a meltdown. <laughs> I'm like, no. I'm going to use the money for this, 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 blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no. He says, we are going to do it. So we ended up winning. Praise Jesus. The victory belongs to him. And uh, <clears throat> so the, ch the money came in and everything. And so the day came to write the check. <laughs> Sister Tina had another meltdown. I was not a cheerful giver. <laughs> so I went home that night and I prayed and I said, God, I said, I want to be a cheerful giver. My husband promised this and I'm going to honor what he did. And God says, remember, this is mine. And I gave you the victory. Well, we wrote the check. Within 24 hours, God did this. Bam. He opened up the door of blessing. I cannot even explain to you all the checks that started coming in, all of the jobs that we had been waiting for. I mean, he just, he blew that door open. So when you guys think that that sacrifice payment that you're doing isn't for anything, when you decide to give that sacrifice, he's going to kick that door open and show you who he is. So if you bring the scripture up, um, Isaiah 54, 2 says, Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them straight forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spark not length thy <laughs> cord. Sorry, I can barely talk. Then strengthen thy stakes. For thy shall put forth <laughs> the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit thy Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. 
Thank you.
Somebody lift up your voice and shout hallelujah. Come on, somebody lift them up in here. You ought to high five your neighbor and say victory is ours. Go ahead and clap your hands unto the Lord one more time. And why don't you lift up your voice while you're clapping your hands and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Come on, somebody lift up a shout in here. Amen. How many are ready to hear the word of the Lord tonight? How many are ready to hear the word of the Lord tonight? We do have a man of God that is going to come and preach the word of the Lord. How many of you are going to respond in faith? How many are going to respond in faith? Amen. How many are going to get the victory tonight? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, as Brother Mitchell comes to preach the word of the Lord, why don't you lift up your hands and lift up your voice and ask God to speak to your heart as he comes to preach. Oh, come on, we can do better than that. Come on, would you lift up your voice? Come on, we declare his glory. The Bible says the heavens, the heavens declare his glory. That's it. Why don't we declare his glory tonight? Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Oh, we praise you, God. We magnify you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, you're worthy. Yeah, that's it. Why don't we praise him just a little bit more? for being here tonight. If we could open our Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Set that one down. Give honor to Bishop in his absence. Give honor to you wonderful saints that came to the house of God on an early, I guess we could say it's spring, on an early spring evening. Don't get too excited. It's probably going to snow again. At least one more time, maybe two more times. <laughs> I am going to do my best to get this done in a reasonable amount of time tonight. And I am also going to do my best to cover at least half of Acts chapter number four tonight. I believe that God wants to speak to us. So we'll read uh, just the opening verse as a launching point, and then we'll pray and you can be seated. It says, and they spake, and they spake unto the people, and as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. And the title I give us for the sake of remembrance is this, The Forgotten Miracle of Acts chapter 4. The Forgotten Miracle of Acts chapter 4. Could you lay your Bibles down and why don't we pray? Jesus, thank you for every faithful saint that's here, every faithful saint that's tuning in. God, I ask that you would heal those that are sick amongst us tonight. Jesus, let your healing virtue go out of this room. There's many that want to be here, God, and they can't because of sickness or affliction. We ask that you would be with them tonight. We ask that you would give us ears to hear your word tonight, God. I know that you want to speak to us tonight, that you want to encourage us and give us strength. In the name of Jesus, give us ears to hear, God. Give us a mind to understand. Help us to open our hearts to your word tonight, God, and give us divine revelation in this house tonight. And everyone said, in Jesus' name, you may be seated. The first four verses of Acts reads like this. I will be honest with you. I did change how I'm trying to preach through the book of Acts. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to do it in blocks of Scripture instead of verse by verse. I'm still preaching verse by verse, but um, if... 
if we expounded on every single point that you can expound upon in the book of Acts, we would never finish the book of Acts. And so we are going to switch it up just a little bit. But the first four verses, it says, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide, or it was nighttime. It was evening, and even the Sanhedrin wants to go home for the night. So they put them in ward, or they put them in jail. Verse 4, How be it, many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. The issue in this opening four verses, the issue that the high priests and the captains or the, uh, the temple guards, if you will, the captain of the temple guards and the Sadducees, the issue that they had was that Peter and John were teaching the resurrection and they were doing so through Jesus Christ. Now we know that it's impossible to teach the resurrection without Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the resurrection. But this is what grieved them. This is what they were frustrated with. The fact that how dare these simpletons stand in Solomon's porch and teach something that they disagreed with very much. Thus, they arrested them. When you have, to bow, when you have the power to do so, why not just arrest those you disagree with? Good thing many of us don't have that power. Amen? <laughs> So they arrest them and they put them in jail. They arrest them because they are trying to stop them from teaching the resurrection. But the damage we find in verse 4, the damage has already been done. Even though they interrupt Peter in the middle of his sermon and it probably caused a little bit of a scene. It seems from the reading of the text that the lame man who was just healed, is also arrested in this whole fiasco here because, as you'll see, he's at the court proceeding the next day. So it seems like Peter, John, and the now healed lame man are all arrested, but it's too late. The damage is already done, and because of the, the apostles' proper teaching of Jesus and the power of the resurrection, there is a resulting five thousand soul revival that sounds exciting to me how would you like to try that for a day christian growth center we we go into a weekend at 182 250 and we come out at 5250 on monday morning i'd like to try that one sunday even if i got to get arrested to do it and so the now, this is important for us to understand. The resurrection is not a sideshow to Christianity. It's not that, okay, we're going to be like Jesus, and then we're going to love like Jesus, and we're going to live like Jesus, and then we'll talk about the resurrection when it comes up. The resurrection is the capstone of all Christianity. Without the resurrection, Christianity is a lie. And we are wasting our time. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. The Apostle Paul writes, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? So the Apostle Paul is saying, Look, we're preaching that Jesus rose from the dead. Why are some of you saying that no one's going to rise from the dead? Verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead... Then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also in vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, and ye are yet in your sins. 
then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life alone we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. The Apostle Paul takes the time to clarify to the church at Corinth that if there is no resurrection from the dead, then everything we've told you is a lie. Because if Christ did not rise from the dead, who was a perfect human being, then you and I have no chance of rising from the dead. And if we have no chance of rising from the dead, then why don't we just go be like the Epicureans? Let us eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. You may not know this, but that's actually a verse in your Bible. Some of us try mighty hard to practice that. Eat, drink, and be merry. (laughs) So the Apostle Paul clarifies that you cannot have Christianity without the resurrection. The power of Christianity is the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. And it came to pass on the morrow, verse 5 of Acts chapter 4, and it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them, the apostles, in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? How did you do this, Peter and John? In verse 5, we have an exact description of the Sanhedrin, even though the word Sanhedrin is not used. Quote, And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. That was the constitution or the coming together of the ancient Sanhedrin. The rulers that is the priests and the officials, the elders, the heads of the chief families in Israel, the scribes, the interpreters of the law, and the teachers of the people. Now, this needs to be, we need to understand what this is because the Sanhedrin would be in effect like you standing before the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, it, was, it is a, a very, very big deal to stand before the Sanhedrin. And as, we'll fi- as the scripture will bear out tonight, Peter and John are on trial to be put to death. That's why they are there. They are on trial to be put to death. And this is actually according to the law. The Sanhedrin is not... They are picking on them because they didn't like what they were preaching. But they have uh, grounds to do what they are doing And you'll find that the Sanhedrin um, used the law very deceitfully. I'll give you one example in passing. They were not allowed, according to the law, to have trials at night. And yet the first trial that Jesus is put in is at night. Another example is the high priest, and and the Apostle Paul actually uh, quotes the law back to him. The high priest tells someone to slap Paul. And Paul gets frustrated and he says, you're standing there to judge me according to the law and you just told someone to slap me which is, con- which is against the law. And then he finds out it's the high priest, which I'm like, how did you not know that was the high priest? But anyway, that's between the apostle Paul and them. So the Sanhedrin could be very deceitful with the law and use it how they wanted. But... The Sanhedrin consisted of 71, it it was constituted of 71 members, and 23 members was considered a quorum. In other words, if there were 23 members present, then they could vote or they could have, uh, they could hold law and they could pass judgment. They didn't have to have all 71 of them there for it to function. This before which such cases, so in other words, John and Peter would be brought before them because they had violated the law. It was, as far as it went, this is a legal assembly, and this is a very serious trial that's going on. Now, before we move on, there are two primary groups of the Sanhedrin. There are the Pharisees, 
which were primarily of the working class. In fact, some theologians think Jesus was a Pharisee of sorts. Why? Because Jesus was a tradesman. He was a carpenter. Now, in today's Christian world, when you say Pharisee, it's almost become a synonymous term with hypocrite. So when you say Pharisee, people think someone who's hypocritical. Um, a lot of the Pharisees were hypocritical. But I don't know that that's, those words are synonymous because Jesus was a teacher and a student of the law from the working class. So not all theologians, but some theologians would say that Jesus was a Pharisee of, fort, uh, of, of sorts. That's the first part of the Sanhedrin. Then you have the scribes and you have uh, the students would have probably been present to observe uh, just like you would in law school once you reach a certain point. The, the students of the law begin to observe actual court cases and court proceedings as they get closer to in actually going out into the working field. So you would have the scribes and the clerks taking, just taking the notes of the proceedings. But the other main, in fact, the predominating power of the Sanhedrin would have been the Sadducees. And I've heard bishops say this all my life. The, Fer or the Sadducees, one of the biggest differences between the Sadducees and the Pharisees was the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And that is why they are sad, you see. There you go. You'll never forget the Sadducees now. So there's actually three things. There are three main places that we need to keep in mind. And one of them, uh, obviously we already mentioned, is that they did not believe in the resurrection. So another thing is the Sadducees denied the supernatural. They denied the supernatural. They affirmed that humans had free will. And they rejected in totality the oral traditions that were taught and insisted upon by the Pharisees. They only accepted the first five books of the Bible. The rest of the Bible they did not necessarily accept as scripture. And they rejected it. They accepted the law of Moses. Which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Um, if you wanted to sum them into one group. They were rationalists. The Sadducees were rationalists. They were religious. There's no doubt that they were religious. Uh, for they believed in God and in the Mosaic law. But they denied every story of the miraculous. So even in the law, they denied, they, or they denied the miracles that happened in the law. They were rationalists. They believed neither an angel nor spirit nor the resurrection. Resurrection they denied. The existence of angels they laughed at. And the idea of spirit or a spirit world they had completely abandoned. The Sadducees were trying to take political power and establish the kingdom of God by political power. Now, why is that important? Because... The miracle we're preaching about tonight is not the healing of the lame man. That miracle is dealt with in Acts chapter 3. There's a miracle that happens in this text that if we are not careful, we run straight over it and it is never mentioned. But it is every bit as powerful as what happened to the lame man. So... That's why we take time to discuss the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. So you understand what the mental attitude was in this room. This is a tense situation. This is the most powerful Jewish gathering that Peter and John and this healed lame man could face in all of Israel. The only thing they could face more powerful than this is the Roman government. They are on trial to be put to death. And Peter and John just got caught preaching enemy number one of the most powerful group in the Sanhedrin. They were preaching the resurrection. It is also important to note that the Sanhedrin was commanded by God and the law to interrogate Peter and John, just as they did. While they probably overstepped 
the law in their handling of the two apostles and this, uh, and this lame man, there was indeed grounds for them to do so. We find this in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. The law says this, And if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, wherefore he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice. Verse 5, And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. This is why Peter and John are on trial. They just performed a sign. There was a man that has been lame for over 40 years that Peter grabbed by the hand and picked up and he started walking and leaping and praising God. The Sanhedrin says in the text, this is a notable miracle. So this is why they're on trial. They're wanting to see if Peter and John will try to lead Israel away from God. And if they do, in any word, if there is any misstep in this trial, Peter and John can be put to death according to the law. So, this is where they are taking their basis from. According to this passage, if Peter and John answer the Sanhedrin incorrectly, the law of Moses condemns them to death. Verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Verses 8 through 12 are a direct fulfillment of the words of Jesus in Luke 12, 11 and 12 when he said, And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take no thought how or what... Thing ye shall answer, or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. And I know this isn't in my notes, but it's too good to pass up. Don't ever pass up standing on the Word of God. If God gave you a promise, you can take that to the bank. He told Peter and John, don't worry about it. Look, John, look, Peter, there's coming a day when they're going to take you and put you on trial. But I'm giving you a promise right now that you don't need to worry about what you're going to say in that moment because I'll be with you. And just a few chapters later in the Bible, we see it fulfilled. That's a testament to us, even on a Tuesday night, that if God gives you a word, you can stand on it. You don't have to be afraid. Is God going to come through? Is God going to make a way? God's going to come through. God's going to fulfill His word to us. So forgive me, but I am going to part. I am going to break this argument down because this is part of the miracle that we're going to talk about in closing. And it gets a little bit technical because this is. A legal fight. So don't worry. I'm not going to be like. I'm not a lawyer. So I can't actually talk like them. But in verse 8. It is powerful that the Bible immediately records. How Peter was able to respond correctly. You see if you want the fulfillment of Luke 12. 11 through 12. You have to walk as Peter walked. Verse 8 says he was filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, then it's impossible for the Holy Ghost to teach you what you're supposed to say in that same hour. And so, because Peter is full of the Holy Ghost in this moment, in this, in, in this instance, then the Holy Ghost can begin to speak and utter out of him the correct things to say 
in this legal proceeding. Verse 9, Peter then points out that they are on trial for a good deed. Peter immediately brings the whole trial back to the main point. The main point is not that they were teaching the resurrection. The main point is they are on trial according to the law. The law didn't say they could be on trial for the resurrection. The law said they have to be on trial for a sign or a wonder. So Peter immediately answers them and says, If we are on trial, if we're being called into question because of what happened to the impotent man, a good deed, he is not allowing the trial to stray away from its original purpose, but he is openly, without fear, confronting the most powerful court in Israel. He and John were arrested for God, using them to heal the lame man and make him whole. Verse 10, Peter then both answers the original question and proceeds to place the blame of the crucifixion of Jesus directly at the people responsible for it. He places it at their feet. He is standing before the court that ordered Jesus to be put to death and he looks at them and says, this man was healed. You asked what name he was healed in? He was healed in the name of Jesus Christ. By the way, that's the same Jesus Christ that just a few days ago, you guys put to death. The very men who condemned Jesus to death without cause are now directly confronted for this sin. Peter says, it is the name of the innocent Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom ye crucified that has made this lame man whole. Verses 10, 11, and 21 are the three verses that answer the law correctly and free Peter and John and the lame man from death. Verses 10 and 11 directly fulfill the commands of Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, and then verse 21 does the same. <clears throat> In verses 10 and 11, Peter is quoting directly from the Old Testament. Psalm 118, 22 through 28. Listen in this passage how many times Jehovah God is referred to. Remember in Deuteronomy 13, if this sign leads the people away from Jehovah, then Peter and John die. And yet in this instance, in this moment, the verse that God quickens to Peter's mind is this passage. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. And this is the Lord's doing. This is Jehovah's doing. It is marvelous in our, in our eyes. This is the day which Jehovah hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Jehovah... Jehovah, I beseech thee, sin now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of Jehovah. Over and over, now you begin to see just how completely God kept his promise in Luke 12, 11, and 12. For such a powerful Old Testament scripture to come to Peter's mind, right when he needed it, that over and over in this passage, it's not taking them away from Jehovah, but it's leading them back to Jehovah. Verse 27, God is Jehovah, which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Verse 28, thou art my God. I will praise thee, thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Notice in this passage that it pushes the reader back to God and thus avoids the judgment of Deuteronomy 13. Verse number 12, Peter says, Jesus' name is quite literally the only human name which could save us. Jesus' name is literally the only name of salvation. Why? Because it is the only name among humanity that conquered death, hell, and the grave. But Jesus is also the name of Almighty God. And Jesus, literally translated to English, is translated as Jehovah has become my salvation. Jesus is the name of God which brings salvation, but it is also the name of the only human being that in the flesh conquered death, 
hell, and the grave. That is why Peter said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no one else who's conquered death, hell, and the grave in the flesh. The wages of sin is death. And because we all live in sin, we all are condemned to death. But Jesus, God manifest in the flesh. Maybe if I preach this on Sunday night, you'd get a bit more excited. But Jesus manifest in the flesh, in the flesh, comes and conquers death, hell, and the grave. That's what gives us the power to overcome sin. Zechariah 14 and 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. Matthew 1, 21 through 23. And she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. While Acts 4.12, and I feel it's important to address this, because Acts 4.12 is almost always quoted in direct reference to baptism. In the apostolic world, when you ask someone, why do I need to be baptized in the name of Jesus? The first place you'll probably get taken to is Acts 2 and 38. The second place you'll probably get taken to is Acts 4 and 12. So while Acts 4 and 12 does not directly speak of baptism, it's not mentioned anywhere in this chapter, in fact. Where the name Jesus, or excuse me, while it does not directly speak of baptism, it is definitely referencing baptism because it is at baptism where the name Jesus is applied to our lives. But verse 12 is referencing much more than just baptism. The verse is the foundation for what the Apostle Paul said in Colossians 3.17 And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving, glory, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. This is why we baptize in Jesus' name. Because if we're not baptized in Jesus' name, then there is no salvation. That's what the Bible teaches. Salvation comes through Jesus' name because what, what is the ultimate thing that every human being faces? Death. And death has come by sin. So sin brings death. And the only way to overcome death is to somehow be connected to a power that can overcome that thing. And the only power that can overcome that thing is Jesus. So when you're baptized in Jesus' name, you're not just, it's not just an outward profession of an inward conversion or of an inward profession, which is what the, the, the non-denominational world tries to say, that baptism is the outward profession of an inward confession. That is not what baptism is. Baptism is you changing your name. You're changing your name from the first man, Adam, which condemns you to hell, to the second Adam, Jesus Christ, which gives you the power to overcome death, hell, and the grave. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The power... Oh, we can't go there. I love talking about the resurrection. When you really begin to grasp the power of the resurrection, it's exciting. Because the power of the resurrection is what gives you the power to overcome addiction. There's no power to overcome addiction without the resurrection. It's the power to change your marriage. It's the power to change your finances. It's the power to change who you are. We and of ourselves cannot really change. Why? Because we're condemned. We're fallen because of Adam's sin. But thank God, a second man, Adam, came along and said, I'm going to write every single thing that the first man, Adam, did wrong. Verse 13 of Acts 4. We got to hurry. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding, so that this is how I know the lame man was there. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, he was right there with them, 
they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? The law has been answered. And they cannot deny that there was a miracle because the evidence is standing right in front of them. What shall we do to these men? For indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them. It is manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem. And even we, we rationalists, we people who say that miracles don't happen, even we cannot deny it. You know, there's people that still deny that miracles don't happen. Miracles happen. You know how I know that? Because I've seen it. But more powerful than that I've seen it is that the word of God declares that it happens. And the word of God it never gave ground saying it would stop. So even these rationalists have to swallow their pride and say, there's a miracle looking us right in the eyes. Verse 17, but that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them. So this is all the Sanhedrin can do now. Let us straightly threaten them <laughs> that they speak henceforth no man, to no man in this name. These verses lay out the shock and disbelief of the Sanhedrin in how Peter and John, men clearly unlearned and ignorant, in the formal rabbinical school of the law. So they're not saying that they're dumb and that they can't read or write. What they're saying when they say they're unlearned and ignorant is that they are not formally trained in rabbinical law. That these men who are not formally trained according to the law answer them so perfectly according to the very law, the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin seen, or excuse me, according to the law that Peter and John had never been formally taught. So the Sanhedrin looks at them and says, we don't know how you're doing this because we know you didn't go to school with us. So how, Peter, how, John, are you taking the law that we are trying to judge you with and as the Apostle Paul wrote, so rightly dividing it? Now you're, I'm kind of giving it away. Now you're beginning to see that the focal point here is not really the lame man. That's Acts 3. Acts 4 is dealing with something much different. The Sanhedrin also makes a great mistake here. I like this point. The Sanhedrin makes a grave error here in assuming that the apostles had been past tense with Jesus. This is incorrect. Yes, they had been with Jesus in the past, but Jesus was in fact present and indwelling both apostles at that very moment and in real time helping them to rightly divide the word of truth. John 14, 16 and 7, Jesus said, And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because, ye have, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The apostle Paul, or the apostle Peter, excuse me, and the apostle John understood something that we would do well tonight to understand. And that is this. If you are spirit filled, it does not matter where you go or what you face. You are not alone. You are never alone. If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, then no matter what you face and no matter where you go, God Almighty is standing there with you. He's standing with you when you go to the courtroom. He's standing with you when you stand on trial, when you when you're put on trial. He's standing with you when you face your worst fears, when you face your worst nightmares, when you face that oppression, when you face that anxiety. Jesus Christ is with you. Stop listening to the devil that tells you you're walking alone. You're not walking alone. If you have the Holy Ghost, you are walking with the most powerful entity that you could ever walk with. You are walking with God Almighty. In fact, the Spirit of Truth was not only telling Peter and John in real time what to correctly say and how to correctly answer the Sanhedrin according to the Old Testament law, but Jesus had also given them an irrefutable sign to back up the words that the apostles were saying. The healed lame man, through this entire discussion, was standing there staring the Sanhedrin in the face. It's really hard to argue with proof like that. 
This left the Sanhedrin with no real, no real way to respond. They had no recourse. A notable miracle had been done which was bringing glory to God and it was not leading people to false gods. And this notable miracle was standing right in front of them. Those who sought to vehemently denounce the, the supernatural were now staring the supernatural directly in the face. The high court was left with one option. Try to bluff and intimidate the apostles into preaching and to not preaching Jesus. And we don't have time to preach this tonight, but that's what Satan does. If you're baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, you have authority over Satan. Don't let the devil lie to you. He's not as powerful as he's telling you he is. The Bible says submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. If you're submitted to God, then you can resist the devil. Stop listening to the lies. The devil can't control your mind. The devil can't control your actions. If you're submitted to God, he has no power over you. We don't have time to go there, but you can go to Revelation chapter 20, Brother Pound. You can go to Revelation chapter 20. And you can read where God sent one angel. He didn't send an army. He didn't send all of heaven. He sent one angel. And one angel walked up and said, Satan, come here. And bound him for a thousand years. That's the kind of power that dwells in us when we have the resurrection. That's why I get excited when I talk about the resurrection. When you're baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And you walk submitted to God. You have that power over the spirits in this city. You have that power on your job. You have that power in your home. You don't have to let those spirits torment you. You can stand up and say, devil, get out of here. And he has to go. <laughs> and threatening him, they let them go. Finding nothing how they could punish them because of the people... For, and this is verse 21, this also fulfills Deuteronomy. For all men glorified God for what was done. Verse 22, for the men, for the man that was healed was above 40 on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And it seems to be, it seems to me the reason why Luke put that he was above 40 is almost as a sign of there was no hope. This man had dealt with this for over 40 years. And so there was no way out for this man. That was just his lot in life. He was just always going to be a beggar. Peter and John now make the court. So now the tables turn. And Peter and John now make the court uneasy. For as they are being commanded not to speak about this Jesus of Nazareth. Peter and John turn the tables on the Sanhedrin. And infer that the Sanhedrin is asking them to violate God's Old Testament law. The very law the Sanhedrin is trying to use to condemn Peter, John, and the lame man. Leviticus chapter 5 verses 1 through 5. And if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and is a witness whether he hath seen it or know of it. And he doth not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. Verse 4, or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, and it be hid from him, then when he know of it, then he shall be guilty in one of these. And it shall be when he shall be guilty in one of these things that he shall confess that he hath sinned in that thing. Leviticus chapter 5 verses 1 through 5 seems to, to infer that if the apostles had shut their mouth, they would have been sinning because they had seen. This is why Peter and John says, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We have to talk about what we've seen because we are commanded to do it. In verse 20, Peter says that, but the inference in the original language is this, and I brought this up a few weeks ago, but it's in the notes, so we'll cover it again. I think I brought it up this last week, actually. Uh, the, Peter says, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Musicians, please come. We're almost done tonight. He says, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. But the inference in the Greek is, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard because we keep seeing them and we keep hearing them. 
And this goes along with the fact that Jesus was not gone. Jesus was just now dwelling in the apostles. So Peter is saying, in essence, if we said it today, well, I'd really like to stop talking about these things, but they just keep happening. Jesus just keeps healing. Jesus just keeps speaking. Jesus just keeps delivering and setting people free. And so the apostles are saying, according to Leviticus, we can't stop talking about it because it keeps happening. The, now the high court can do nothing. Deuteronomy 13 has not been violated in any way. And in fact, now it seems that they themselves are in violation of Leviticus chapter 5. All the court can do at this point is to bluff and threaten. They have no legal means whatsoever to punish or prosecute the apostles and the lame man. It seems that the lawyers have been completely beaten by the servants of the lawgiver. But now what is this miracle that happened in this chapter that is so easily forgotten? To figure this out, we actually have to turn to the book of Matthew. We have to step away from Acts for a minute and we have to turn to Matthew. Matthew 26, 69 through 70. Now Peter sat without in the palace and a damsel or a servant girl, a young servant girl, came to him saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. Now keep in mind, Jesus at this very moment is standing before the Sanhedrin at night being condemned to die. He's being condemned to die right now. And Peter is outside. Much He doesn't have the courage to stand up to the Sanhedrin. He's outside. He doesn't even have the courage to stand up to a young girl. Just a few hours earlier, he said, Jesus, I'll die for you. I'll never betray you. I'll, I'll, I'll fight. He pulls his sword. He chops the guy's ear off because he don't know how to swing a sword right. Obviously. I don't know if you know this, but swords are meant to chop ears off. Matthew 26, 71, 72. And when he had gone out into the porch, another maid saw him, another young lady, and said unto him, that were there. This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath. He promised. He made an oath. I do not know this man. This doesn't sound like the Peter of Acts 4. Matthew 26, 73 and 74. And after a while came to him they that stood by. So now it's not the Sanhedrin. It's just the servants that were around the fire trying to stay warm on a cold night. And this small group, they said unto Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. He loses his temper. He's cussing a blue streak, saying, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. The miracle that is most often forgotten in Acts chapter 4 is what happened to the Apostle Peter between this account and Acts chapter 4. The miracle is that just weeks before Acts 4, Peter could not even stand up to the scrutiny of two young ladies, servants, and a few people gathered around a campfire. And now somehow in these few weeks, Peter has found the courage to stand before the only court that isn't Roman that can kill him. And not only say, I know Jesus, but look at them and say, I know Jesus. Jesus just healed this lame man and you're the ones that put him to death. That's the forgotten miracle of Acts chapter 4. Not only did Jesus heal the lame man who had no hope left of ever walking, but Jesus also gave boldness to Peter to become as bold as a lion in the face of the most severe adversity. So how does this happen? I'm so glad you asked. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said to Peter, and to the rest of the disciples. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses of me. Both in Jerusalem. And in all Judea. And in Samaria. And into the uttermost part of the earth. It is in the nature of Jesus to change 
heal, restore, and empower every single thing and every single person he comes in contact with. Yes, God can heal the lame man. God did heal the lame man. But God can also look at a broken and insecure Peter and say, I can heal the lame man, but I can give you power. I can give you security in who you are. I can give you the courage to look at the thing that you fear the most. <clears throat> Jesus can immediately restore strength if we stand tonight. Can we stand tonight? Excuse me. Jesus can immediately restore strength to the ankle bones of the lame man. But God can also heal fears of repeating the past. The hidden brokenness of past failures where Peter must have said, what if I deny him again? What if I fail again, God? What if I curse you and run away again? In one instant, all of that is replaced by the divine boldness of God Almighty as he looks at the Sanhedrin and says, not again, but today I will preach Christ and him crucified. Don't be so quick to skip past this miracle. If God can heal Peter's frailty, then God can heal ours. Yes, Jesus can heal cancer, but Jesus can also heal our marriages. Yes, Peter, Jesus can let you walk on water, but he can also help you live above your fears and your self-doubt. Young people, overcoming your fear to teach and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ is just as great a miracle as the lame man walking. When you pick up a Bible study chart, And you walk up to somebody and you deny everything inside of you that says, don't do this, you'll look like an idiot. That is the divine power of God working just as if God healed cancer. Just as if God healed diabetes. Just as if God healed depression. Don't mistake it for what it is or what it isn't. That is a miracle of God. Peter confronting the Sanhedrin was just as great as miracle in its own right as the lame man walking into the same meeting with Peter. God healing your depression is just as great as God raising the dead. God restoring your faith is just as great as God opening the blinded eyes. Just because you don't see the miracle doesn't make it anything else. Don't be afraid to take the invisible and give it to him and watch God work with it. Why don't we come for just a few moments tonight? Why don't we ask God for this boldness? Why don't we ask God to overcome this fear, this anxiety? If God can help Peter overcome insecurity, then God can help you overcome insecurity. So many times we skip through this chapter and we celebrate the lame man, but we never pick up on the miracle in Peter's life. But God can do that for Peter and God can do that for you. Why don't we pray tonight? Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We glorify your name, Jesus. God, give us the courage and the strength to go out of this house and be all that you've called us to be. I don't want to live in intimidation, God. I don't want to live in the fear of my past. I don't want to live in the fear of all the times I've failed you, Jesus. Let there be boldness granted to your children. Give us the boldness of the Holy Ghost, God. Oh, we worship you, Jesus.
powers in the Holy Ghost. That's what gave Peter boldness. It wasn't that Peter found some secret potion or, or some seance that he could say no. It said Peter came into contact with the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's what gave Peter the courage to confront the Sanhedrin. That's what gave John the courage to stand with Peter. That's what's going to give you courage tonight. That's what's going to get you through the dark times. That's what's going to get you through adversity. It's the power of the Holy Ghost. Come on, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. That's how you're going to overcome your fear, young person. That's how you're going to overcome the intimidation. It's in the Holy Ghost. It's coming in contact with Jesus. And letting Him give you power to become a witness. John and Peter learned and taught us some valuable lessons in this. You don't have to have all the answers. They're ignorant. They're unlearned. They don't know how you're supposed to operate in this realm of law and legality and, and what am I supposed to say and what am I not supposed to say. 
But if you know the one who wrote the law, young people, you're not going to have all the answers. When you start witnessing, you don't have to have all the answers. Fix them. Our job is to get them to Jesus. He's the one that's going to fix them. Amen. Tonight as we leave this house, please remember, let's grab some church cards. Let's go find them. Let's find them, young people. Let's find them, Christian Growth Center. They're in this city. They need God. They need God. Let's find them. Let's invite them. Also, please remember this Friday night at 7.30. Young people, we will be meeting here and we will be watching the Friday night of No Limits via the interwebs. It's going to be an exciting and wonderful time. So be here at 7.30. Grab some food. We're going to eat. The service will begin at 8.30 p.m. Their service will begin at 8.30 p.m. And we will be watching that. It's going to be a wonderful time. And I believe God's going to speak to us even if we're however many thousand plus miles away so that's going on friday night and then also let's do our best i know we're in a a, in a new month we're in the month of march and we're not going to take necessarily commitments tonight for the sake of time but let's do our best to teach a bible study this month it's not that hard to teach a bible study you can do it anybody can teach a bible study if you need help i can give you bible studies where you literally just read it And it will walk them through the plan of salvation. And then if they have questions and you can't answer it, call me. Call Bishop. Call one of the the ministers in this church or call your parents or reach out and say, hey, I need some help. That's what we're here for. This is a body. This is a family. And we're here to help you do that. So let's remember to do that. And then do not forget. Do not neglect. Let's continue to work through reading our Bible in a year. And we will see you all here Friday night at 730 for a time of fellowship in the Holy Ghost. God bless you. Love one another. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. I just wanted to warn you, that way you're not.